So to talk about eSport, who better than the co-founder and CEO of Team Vitality, one of the top European eSport teams. Team Vitality is home to 80 people, spread amongst 10 different teams with sponsors like Adidas, Orange, Gotaga, that you know, the number one eSport athlete in France, with 3 million point two YouTube followers, is a proud ambassador of Vitality and part of the Fortnite team. Recently, they raised 20 million euros to become one of the top teams in the world. So for all these reasons, please give a big round of applause to Nicolas Moer. Hello, everyone. Um, OK, so thanks, Martial, for the invitation. Is it? Yeah, OK. So um, I'm here to talk about eSport. Uh, I don't see that, that many familiar faces. Uh, so that's good because I will try to explain eSport at a very basic level and try to uh, give you a, a, a proper understanding. So the presentation is about why is eSport only getting started? And now uh, we'll look about that. Yeah. So I'll start with a, a very basic question trying to explain what is this part exactly, uh, how does it work, and yeah. Okay, so on a very simple level, eSport is about video game competition, uh, be it individual competition on games like FIFA, StarCraft, Hearthstone, or team competition on games that you probably know, Counter-Strike, League of Legends, and so on. Uh, but you could say, if you're just playing with a friend, uh, it's competitive in a way, but is it eSport? It's the right question. Uh, that's why we mostly speak about eSports when we have people watching. That's why I'm speaking about community here. So eSport, you have teams or players competing and people watching, watching them. That is eSport. Um, eSport is worldwide. Right now, um, it's very strong in many parts of the globe. For example, I'll give you a few examples. In, uh, in Asia right now, uh, in China especially, you have millions of people playing competitive video game and watching. A few examples, uh, recently there was the final, the League of Legends World Championship final, and it gathered 99 million person watching, which is uh, enormous, and most of those viewers come from China. And you can compare those numbers to uh, big sports events like the NBA final or stuff like that. Uh, another example, uh, two years or three years ago, the World Championship of League of Legends, the final took place in the bird nest in Beijing, which is the Olympic stadium that was used for the Olympic Games uh, in Beijing. And it was completely filled uh, to see uh, two teams of League of Legends playing together. Uh, it's in North America, it's strong too, and in Europe, we have a, a very strong market. So eSport is all over, all over the world. Um, it's growing very fast. I didn't put a lot of number in the presentation because I don't think it's the most int interesting part. But and I will get back to that, to the demography, to the people uh, playing and watching watching games. Uh, it's growing very quickly. Um, like year over year, we're seeing between 30 and 50 percent increase in the viewership. Uh, it's an hybrid phenomenon between sport and entertainment. Uh, Esports, if you look about it, it uh, it's very look like traditional sports. You will have teams like ours, Team Vitality. You will have pro players signed to the teams. You will have competition in the form of league or tournaments. Um, you will have sponsor, brand that sponsor the league or sponsor the team. So it's exactly like traditional sports. The difference is that you don't have a player running in a field trying to score goals. You just have players uh, playing console games, uh, PC games, or even mobile games. It's a uh, is getting started, especially in Asia. Not, not too much in the Western world yet. Uh, and it's hybrid between sport and entertainment. Why do we say that? Because eSports is already entertainment at the pro level, especially if you look at uh, the North American League, for example, the NBA. Uh, it's the epitome of entertainment, obviously. But in eSports, you have one more layer. Um, you have the streamers. You must know Twitch. Twitch is an Amazon-owned website that broadcasts people playing video games all day long. And most of those players, uh, they are not pro. They are not the best. They are mostly entertainers, influencers. That's why this is not really eSports. This is a big debate in the eSports community. Could we say that those players, those streamers, are 
esports player? I don't think so, but the point is that uh, they are very close to esports, very connected. And it's an entry door for the young people especially. Uh, they watch those streamers, and maybe that's a way for them to get connected to esports. So we are at the, at the crossroad between those two worlds. Uh, and what's interesting in esports is trying to understand the way it was created and it, uh, it's getting structured. So it's kind of a unique ecosystem. At the top of this ecosystem, you have the publisher, because without game, you don't have esports, and they own the IP. That's the, one of the key differences with traditional sports. In traditional sports, you can play football in the street. No one will sue you. Uh, you can do whatever. You can play tennis with your friend. In eSports, if you want to do anything, you have to use the property of a publisher. So, of course, they have a lot of power in this ecosystem. Uh, let's, uh, if, if we look uh, a few years back, the way eSports was built, it's very different country by country. Uh, for example, in, uh, in Korea, it's really mainstream. So, in Korea, you can walk into the street and see advertisement for, with a pro eSports player promoting to space. It's very normal in uh, a lot of Asian countries. We are not there yet in Europe. But let's look at the way, um, the way it was structured. And uh, let's connect that to our story because we started Vitality in 2013 and I get back to that. So uh, in 2013, for example, we started the team with people playing in Call of Duty. Call of Duty was published by, and still is published by Activision. And it's a game that uh, really followed the traditional AAA model, 60 to 70 euro game every year. And what happened is that the publisher, they really didn't care about the competitive aspect of the game. Basically, they put a lot of money in the development of Call of Duty every year, they ship the game, they make their money, and they prepare the next one. So they were not taking care of the, the players wanting to compete. So what happened is that eSport uh, started in a kind of a grassroots way, where the fans are uh, starting to play against each other, where some people created websites to create competition, when some companies started to happen, you might know ESL, which is a billion dollar company, and they, they grew uh, organizing esports tournament. Uh, you have a lot of other companies like DreamHack and so on. So basically, it was not the publisher doing esports, it was the fan and then some, some third party companies. But after a while, what happened is that most of the publisher understood that they were losing value. Because those competitions had a lot of viewer, a lot of interest, and most of the publishers are now understanding that they should do eSports themselves. And that we are seeing a big move right now with publishers like uh, Blizzard uh, doing the Overwatch League, a lot of other publishers taking reign, taking control of, the, of their competitive ecosystem. And the, on, the, the first, let's say, the first publisher that did that uh, in 2013 or even before 2012 may maybe is Riot Games that is publishing League of Legends. And they were the first to do eSports on their own. They built a studio. Uh, in Germany, they hired people, uh, specialists of broadcast, uh, they hired talent in the cast, they put the team in Berlin uh, with, in Team House, they did everything, they spent a lot of money to create eSport on their own. And they, they were the only one doing that. And now, mostly everyone is following this model. And why were they doing that at the time? It was really for marketing purpose, because uh, they understood that putting, creating a great product that people would want to watch, called the LCS, the League of Legends Championship Series. Many people would watch that on Twitch, and Twitch at the time was booming. Uh, so those people that were watching League, they, they thought maybe, oh, that's a new game. I don't know this game. I might try. And then it attracted a lot of new people to the game. The game that is uh, free to play. So new people playing means a lot more revenue for the publisher. Now it's, the big change is that the publisher understands that eSport can make money. It's not only about spending money for marketing, it's also getting money back. Because if you think about it, eSport and competition, competitive eSport is a product that a lot of people want to watch. And if people want to watch, uh, you will have people that want to pay to get the rights, the media rights, like you would see for the Champions League, uh, the, the World Cup in football. And you will have a lot of brands that are ready to pay to sponsor the events. So that's why right now there is a big interest from the brands, the big interest in eSports, because they understand that eSports is a way to to touch and to interact with the 12 to 15 years old people, mostly male. That's another topic, and we, we tackled that a bit in the, in the previous uh, speech. Uh, but uh, eSports is very far from what we need in terms of gender equality. But this being said, uh, the brands are really interested because they can touch those consumers. 
but let's get back a bit. Why are people watching esports? Because it's very easy for everyone here to understand why people uh, play video games. It's fun, it's challenging, it's social, it's whatever you want. We all play, or maybe we almost all of us, we play video games. That's easy to understand. But why would people watch other people play video games? That's a question that many people cannot understand. And I'll try to, to explain. Uh, first of all, when you're doing any skill-based activity, be it a normal sport, football, tennis, or uh, chess, for example, uh, you, you're good to an extent, you have a certain skill level, but you might be interested to see the best players in the game. Uh, if you're playing tennis, uh, you might want to turn your TV on and see Federer, because he's doing things that you will never, ever, ever do, even if you try very hard. Uh, it's the same in eSports. You can plug, you can, let's say, turn on Twitch, and watch the best teams, the best players. They will do things that you cannot ever imagine doing, even if you play thousands of hours. And that's the one of the biggest interests. That's why people watch. Because you might not realize, let's say some of you guys, you come to a League of Legends competition, you will watch the game on the big screen, and suddenly something happens and the whole crowd will erupt and scream, and you would be like, yeah, I have no idea what happened. But for the people watching, it was just a crazy outplay, crazy moment, uh, a lot of skill that was just displayed. So people want to see the best people playing. And we say athlete, it's not a coincidence, because the pro player right now, uh, it's let's say it's very demanding what they're doing. They're playing 10 to 12 hours a day. Uh, they are the very best in their category, for example, and I'll get back to that. In League of Legends, you have 50 pros in Europe and two million people playing. So I let you imagine how difficult it is to be a pro player. Um, so the athlete. But the second point is that everyone can play the game. To an extent, some games are easier to pick up than others, but let's take Counter-Strike. It's quite easy to understand what's going on. You have to kill people, okay? Uh, it's easy to play, it's easy to have some fun, but you can play thousands of hours and still not master the game because uh, it's very Demanding, you have to learn a lot of things, you have to understand a lot of things, you have to guess, you have to do a lot of, you have to be very quick on your mouse and stuff like that. So, uh, and we'll get back to that, how to do an esports game, but basically, only a few people can be very great at the game. And the last reason why people would watch esports is that uh, right now, nowadays, it's, uh, it has very high production value. You can uh, watch competition that takes place in big stadiums. For example, right now, there is the Counter-Strike Major in Katowice in Poland, and it will be uh, next week in a 15,000 people arena uh, with a huge screen, uh, fantastic setup. The game themselves, they are very tense. You can have last minute changes in the scoreboard. You can have a, a lot of things going on. So it's really great to watch. Uh, I, I encourage you to try. So to talk briefly about uh, Vitality, which is not the whole point, but uh, I give you a, a glimpse of who we are and what we're doing. We're a, a multi-gaming organization. What does that mean? That means, for example, uh, if you look at sports, you look at Real Madrid, uh, they have a football team, but they also have a basketball team, handball team, they have maybe six, seven teams in different sports. We are doing the same in esports. So we have a League of Legends teams, Counter-Strike, uh, Hearthstone, Rainbow Six, FIFA, PUBG, Fortnite, and so on. Uh, the list is long, but that's what we do. And we are the biggest esports organization in France. And when we say the biggest, it's because we have the biggest number of fans, the best teams, the best partners, uh, the biggest budget, and so on. And we are one of the biggest in Europe right now. Uh, and we are working, uh, and Martial told that briefly, we are working with top tier brands, for example, Orange, Renault, uh, Adidas and so on. So, so the same brands that you could see in traditional sports. Basically what we're doing is very close to running a sports club. Uh, we have the same problematic, the same issues, the same challenge. One of the key difference is that we don't have our own stadiums yet. It might come in the future. For example, in China, all of the biggest organizations, they have their stadium. It's not uh, 80,000, 80, but you can see 2,000 to 3, 4,000 arenas that are filled every week. Okay, maybe in Europe uh, it will take a bit of time. But basically we're a sports club. We have more than 50 players, more than 1 million of fans, and we raise more than 20 million euros. Uh, notably with uh, French VCs one year ago, Corelia, 
and now with a, a family office uh, based in London. Uh, why would people invest in Vitality? Um, why are we trying to build? We are looking at traditional sports and we are trying to be one of the biggest esports organizations in the world because we think it will be structured the same way sports is. For example, in football, you will find uh, 10 top teams in Europe. Manchester United, Real Madrid, PSG, and so on. And the gap between those teams and uh, the teams uh, under them, for example, let's say uh, Lyon or Marseille, uh, the gap, uh, not, I don't want to, to piss anyone, but there is an objective gap between those teams in terms of fandom, revenue, sponsors. It's, uh, it's enormous. And we see esports getting structured the same. And we want to be one of those biggest teams when we can uh, then uh, get the, the biggest share of the revenue. And I, I'm not here to speak about the business model, but basically that's the whole plan, is creating a brand with a lot of fans uh, everywhere in the world engaged in the project. And the last thing is that we want fans that are like the sports fan. Uh, historically in esports, the fan would follow the players uh, because the teams, the brands were very weak a few years ago. And for example, uh, you would be a fan of a player and the player would sign to another team and then you would support this other team. Obviously, we don't want that. What we want is to attract fans when we win, but also keep those fans when we lose. And again, if I, we take some sports example, uh, if you look at Marseille, very sorry for the, the Marseille fans. They can be losers for 20 years, but they, they will still have a lot of fans. That's it, because the fans are emotionally attached. They grew up with the club. Obviously, we don't have the local attachment, but we want to create that. Fans that stay with us, whether we win, whether we lose. That's the goal. Um, no, and maybe that's uh, this interesting part for you guys. Uh, what makes a good esports game? This is not an easy one because many publishers, many developers are trying and not many are succeeding. Uh, first of all, uh, the skill pyramid is super important. So those figures come from League of Legends. Uh, they can be a bit different depending on the games, but it's always the same idea. Is that you need to have very big difference in skills at every level of the pyramid. Uh, again, if I do an analogy with chess, I can beat my neighbor. But my neighbor will be where, let's say, he will be beat by his teacher at the chess club. The teacher will be beat by the chess master and so on. And at every level of the pyramid, there is a big gap. And what's very interesting is that, for example, if you take in League of Legends the diamonds player, that means they are ranked diamond. It's the top 1% of the players. Uh, and we put our League of Legends pros against a diamond player. They would just say, those guys are shit. I, I lose, I'm losing my time playing against them because there is a huge skill difference. And even at the top level, if we look at the 10 best players in League of Legends, they are way better than the top 50. And even at the very uh, very best, the very top of the pyramid, you can have, like in sports, you can have the Michael Jordan of esports. For example, a very well-known guy is called Faker. And this guy basically won half of the world championship in League of Legends. It's just above. At every level of the pyramid, you can have skill difference. and that, for a player, it's super interesting because you want to grow, you want to uh, rank up the ladder, but even if most players, they think they can achieve and they can go to the top, they obviously cannot because it's also a matter of talent. You can play a lot, but it's like in sport. You need to have talent and dedication. And as, a, as an aside, we receive like 100 messages every day saying, yeah, I want to be part of Team Vitality. I want to be a pro player. And those people, they just don't realize how difficult it is and the very low number at the top of the pyramid. So that's one part. Uh, other part is obviously, it's not mandatory, but uh, the free-to-play model uh, has a lot of merits, but uh, you know all of that better than me. Uh, you need to attract a lot of people and get them hooked. Uh, easy to enjoy is connected to that. That's not 100% true because some of the, some of the esports games are not that easy to pick up. But let's say the goal for the publisher is to have the player hooked instantly and then put into the competitive ecosystem. Another interesting part is the, the update frequency. Again, looking at League of Legends, which is a, an example I use a lot, every two weeks, the game is updated. And that means uh, potentially new champions, uh, balance update, fine tuning of items, a lot of small changes, but that, that make the games uh, different every time. You cannot get bored. And 
That's very key because in traditional sports, obviously the rules of football don't change. In eSports, uh, every two weeks, every month, depending on the publisher frequency, the game is new, the game is different. You have to learn again, you have to adapt. Uh, that's very important to get and keep players interested in the game. Not only from a player's perspective, but also from a viewer's. Even if you're only watching, the game is always new. The game is always different. That's key. Uh, another key part, uh, in my opinion, is, is the team side. Because, again, uh, individual esport, 1v1 esport exists, but uh, team esport is more interesting, get more viewers. A, bit, uh, a big example would be StarCraft. That was one of the first big esports game, and is now almost disappeared. It's still a niche, and uh, hopefully I don't offend any fan, but StarCraft is out of the, out of the radar, and it's mostly team games right now. Um, another thing we can note is that most of the esports success were mostly community-driven, and that means esports was not uh, part of the plan for the publishers. It's the community that uh, took interest in the game, and uh, then the publisher realized, or some people created tournaments, as I said, and when publishers try to force esports in games that are not done for esports, it usually fails. An example of a uh, big push from the publisher would be Overwatch. Overwatch is not a failure, the Overwatch League, but it doesn't attract that many viewers. Because the game itself is not that good to watch. It's a great game to play, but not really a great game to watch because it's too fast-paced, uh, too much action, and it doesn't really work as an esport. Some people might disagree, but that's my point. So if you look at the, the biggest esports game, what's super interesting is that they are very old. Uh, League is 10 years, uh, 10 years old, Dota the same, Counter-Strike is 20 years old. So it's very interesting because people will always say, okay, the video game ecosystem is changing every day. Uh, how can we invest, for example? Yes, that's true to an extent. You have new games coming, obviously Fortnite, Apex uh, very recently. But if you look at the big leaders in esports, it's always the same games. Uh, and when I say the big games in esports, it's because those are the games that attract the most viewership and the most audience and attendance at live events. And by the way, something I, I forgot to say is that esports is offline. Like, maybe it is not clear for everyone, but uh, esports is not about online tournaments. No one watch online tournaments, or maybe a few people watch. But every esports event takes place in a, in a regular arena uh, be it a 1,000, 10,000, 15, or big stadium sometimes. And for example, this year there will be the League of Legends World Final in the Accor Hotel Arena. So uh, that will be really big to, to get more mainstream recognition, uh, which is uh, the next point. Uh, what's the future for us and for the esport industry? To me, it's getting mainstream because right now uh, esport is really a niche. When I say a niche, that doesn't mean it's not big. Because it is big, there is money, there is a lot of fans, a lot of interest, so it's big, yes, but it's still a niche because outside of the people that know this part, uh, most people have no idea about this part. They never heard about that. You can, maybe some of you never heard, I don't know. Uh, you can ask, when I ask my parents or older people, they have no idea. So this part is not mainstream at all. It's getting mainstream slowly, uh, obviously because uh, of the demographic, you have a lot of new, younger people starting to watch Twitch, starting to know about esports, starting to follow us. I would say most, let's say 80% of our, the fan we acquire are between 12 to 15 right now, thanks to Fortnite, in a way. So it will get mainstream eventually, but there is still a big challenge that we face as an industry, it's the game themselves. For example, uh, League of Legends, Dota, uh, you can try to watch those games, you would, then, you would not understand anything if you're not a player yourself. Because they are so deep, so complicated. You have uh, 140 champions in league. They all have four skills. You have 100 items. So if you watch a League of Legends game, you have no idea what's going on. And that's a big issue. Because if we want to attract viewers, uh, we need to go beyond uh, only the players. Obviously, you have so many people playing that it's still enough to get a lot of viewers, but if we want to break that ceiling and go way beyond, we have to get mainstream. And then uh, the ball is in the publisher side because they have to create games that are very easy to pick up. If I turn on my TV, I watch football, I would understand in five minutes that the goal is to put a ball in a net. It's easy. If you watch League of Legends, you have no idea. So 
will we get games that are very easy to understand, very easy to, to get attracted to, but at the same time, very deep, very hard to master, with a, a huge strategic side. I think this is one of the big, uh, one of the big next step. And the publisher that will find this secret sauce or secret recipe uh, can do something really tremendous. And I'm not too sure Fortnite is uh, simple and mainstream enough to, to get to that point. And, but that's uh, another debate. So we'll see how it goes. Thanks a lot, Nicola. I know you like this picture, I so uh, I put it again. Uh, do we have questions for uh, Nicola? No question? Uh, yes, one question. So first, thank you for everything you said. And uh, I have a question about fighting games. Uh, I know you have a team, a Team Vitality. Uh, but what do you see for the future of fighting games? Because, as you said, they are 1v1 games. And uh, as we've seen recently, it's, uh, it's quite hard for them to compete with uh, team games. What do you see? Uh, and uh, what would you like to see for these games for the future? So fighting game right now, I would say they are in a good state, eSport-wise, uh, in the sense that uh, most of them, the biggest, like Street Fighter, Smash Bros., which is big in North America, they're all filling a niche uh, with a lot of fans, very dedicated fans. If you look at Fortnite, for example, you will have a lot of very casual fans of the game, some hardcore fans, but if you look at uh, people watching Smash Bros, you have only hardcore fans, basically, because it's a game that, uh, it's a strange example, because it's a super easy game to pick up, but at the same time, it's so technical, so complicated. So I think, I don't see fighting games uh, being mainstream or being, Enormous. I see them filling some niche with very dedicated communities, and uh, it's working well. It's just I don't expect to be way bigger. Um, it's very hard to predict uh, what happens in esports. It's, so yeah. One question there. Hi. Um, any thoughts on uh, uh, esports on mobile? Um, I, th I think of the example of, of uh, Supercell who had made few initiatives on esports with uh, Clash Royale, for example. So any thoughts about that? Yeah, so um, it's an interesting question. Uh, we, uh, one year ago, we bet on mobile esports. Uh, oh, let's say I, I will go uh, even uh, two years or three years ago. So when we started Vitality, we were a console team on Call of Duty. And at the time, uh, you have this very big fight between the console gamers and PC gamers. The PC gamer were like, oh, we are the, the true gamers the, with the complex games. You guys on console, you're, it's not interesting, it's shit, it's not eSport. Uh, now it's changed. Like everyone accept console eSport. You have, uh, you have Call of Duty, you have FIFA, you have a lot of games, it's fine. And I think mobile is the same. Right now it's in a bad state for the hardcore eSports fan because they say, yeah, it's for, uh, mobile is not eSport, which is kind of stupid because to me, eSport is not about the device. It's about the, the interest of watching game, the complexity of the game, and so on. So I think mobile eSport should grow. And, and when we look at China, if you go to China, you have Honor of Kings, or whatever, I always forgot the name, uh, which is called Arena of Valor in Europe. It's uh, 200 million players. And there, if you want to, as a team, to go in the league, the professional league, it costs 12 million euros. Uh, so it's insane. It's big, you have a lot of people watching. Uh, and by the way, it's a 50-50 uh, male and female, the audience, which is very different than what we have uh, in Western esports. So in China, it's very natural. It's kind of one of the biggest games. It's there. So one year ago, we bet on the European version of the game, Arena of Valor. We saw Tencent, the publisher, uh, would make it grow in Europe. The game would get big, and it didn't happen. Uh, so right now, in Europe, you don't have that many big esports titles. You have Clash Royale. Uh, which is one of the examples. It's not a huge success on the esports side, I mean. Uh, you have viewers, but not that many. Uh, very interestingly, it's not the same community because it's not on Twitch, it's on YouTube. Like, uh, Clash Royale on Twitch is very low, whereas on YouTube it's big. Traditional esports is very low on YouTube, very big on Twitch. So it's not exactly the same community. It's not exactly accepted as an esport by many people. It's working, but it's not big yet, and I'm waiting for a mobile game to, to change that. Very impatient about that. 
one final question. Um, you drew a lot of parallels with uh, real sports and esports. Uh, two part question. One first part is um, how much of your fans' loyalty to uh, Vitality is based out of the brand Vitality as opposed to star players, like you said, Faker? Uh, so, how much of that is this, if Faker leaves his team, is people, are people going to stop support the next team? The second part is related to the same topic of. Um, is there already a system of transfers between teams and is that go loans, for example, for players or is that going to come up soon, do you think? Yeah, f the first part, uh, I cannot say with certainty because it's one of our big challenges, estimating our number of fans. You cannot just add up the fans on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram because a lot of them are the same. So it's the challenges we have as a team. By the way, it's the same for, I would say, a traditional sport instead of real sport. I do think it's real sport. We might disagree. Uh, anyway, finding the real number of fans is not easy, so it's even harder to find the fan that would leave if we transfer a player. Very tough question, but what we saw is uh, we had a Gotaga, uh, some of you may know is uh, the biggest streamer on Fortnite and uh, many games. Uh, we founded the team with him, and uh, one year ago he left the team, uh, one year after that he left the team, and we were like, okay, we're done. We were a young company at the time. Okay, we're done. He's out. People are fan of Gotaga, not Vitality. And then we realized we got a lot of messages, a lot of messages saying, hey, okay, we love Gotaga, but we still love what you're doing, guys. We love the team. We, uh, we love your story, your storytelling, and uh, we'll follow you. So that was kind of a, a, a big moment for us. We understood that we had a brand. We had something. And it's way more true right now because we worked hard on the brand, the brand values, and so on. So I would say right now, uh, we are not dependent of any player, but obviously losing a star player might hurt us a lot. And the second part, uh, yes, a lot of transfers. Uh, a few years ago, it was not the case because player would sign one-year contract. If you sign a one-year contract and so, some team want to, uh, to get your player, they will just wait the end of the contract. But no, his part is like two, three, four-year contracts. Then if a team wants my player that is contracted for three years, they will have to pay. And it happens a lot. Uh, in Counter-Strike, you have, uh, let's say, transfer that are uh, in the hundreds of thousands of euros. Like, uh, not to the million yet, but we're getting close. Uh, so, yeah, it's getting big, and it's a big part of the revenue model for the teams in the years to come. Thanks a lot, Nicolas. Thank you. Please, big round of applause.